Gambling, gambling, gambling. From bingo games in church basements to the dazzling races at a Kentucky Derby, games of chance and placing wagers have been part of human society since time immemorial. Whether you're bonding over a poker game on a garage or you're buying a ticket in a Queen of Hearts raffle to build a new gym on the side of the school for the kids, gambling could be the glue that holds us all together. Like when my sister-in-law Donna says, you're no good, you spent all your money buying pull tabs and drinking Brandy Alexander's down at the banquet hall, I could say that I was supporting my boss's kids' girls' volleyball team away game fund. No matter what you call it, I'm completely destitute and have spent my last dime. And that's why we're so excited to partner with Birch Mattress. Don't gamble on a good night's sleep. Birch is running a sale now. You get about 20% off if you go online on her website. You check out Birch's site for more details. Birch mattresses are crafted with organic and natural materials that have been sustainably sourced. Their mattresses aren't made from polyurethane foam that could cause harmful off-gassing and are free from fiberglass, which can be harmful to your health. It was important for me to choose a birch mattress made with organic and natural materials because I can sleep easy knowing that I am avoiding the harmful off-gassing that can occur from polyurethane foams. You don't want that stuff. I ordered the Birch Lux Natural Mattress, a premium upgrade from the original well-loved Birch Natural Mattress. I've had my Birch mattress for about six months now, and this thing's real comfortable. Let me tell you here. Hang on. With your Birch mattress, you get a 100-night sleep trial guarantee, along with a 25-year warranty. Yeah, you get a sleep trial. You don't got to roll the dice on that. You see what I did there? The best part about all of this is that Birch delivers the mattress to your door for free in the USA. They also offer in-home setup, removal, uh, to make your buying experience as convenient as possible. You don't like it, they'll come take it away. I love my Birch mattress, and I think you would too. If you're looking for a new bed, check out Birch Living. They're currently offering 20% off, so it's the perfect time to upgrade your sleep and get two free EcoRest pillows. Visit birchliving.com slash crimepace to find out more about this limited time offer. Time! You know, there's nothing like some good old Texas country roads in blue bonnet season, but I would never call them blue bonnets because it's a stupid name, no offense. I just call it lupinous texensis because, uh, uh, you know, that's just what I'm, I'm used to. I, I know the lupins. There's many species. Anyway, what we're doing here today, we're get to getting a whiff of the, the flowers and with the shit. Who the fuck doesn't like flowers? You got to have something wrong with you. Taking in the ambiance, all right? So we got something to think about when we're, you know, sitting in a shopping center parking lot or bank or whatever the hell I want to die. Uh, so we're going to soak in the ambience, but we're also collecting seed of this beautiful bastard over here, Castilea in Divisa. Probably one of the showiest, the most beautiful members of the genus Castilea. Get this guy out of there. Uh, in in Texas. I mean, there's a couple. There's quite a few, but you can see it's got really remarkable flowers there. Looks to be hummingbird pollinated. You got yellow styles poking out. Uh, and this is, I believe it's an annual. Might have a perennial root, but definitely the top dies. You can see these are already withering. So how do you grow this, all right? You collect these. These are just ovaries and they contain ovules. Ovaries, another word for fruit. This, in this case, it's the dried, the hissing capsule when it dries out. And ovules are another word for seed. And you can see them right there. And they're what is left over when this flower gets pollinated, all right? And you can see there's gonna be a lot of uh, ripened ovaries, a lot of ripened fruits to collect and get seed. This is actually a hemiparasite, so it's a partial parasite. You can see it's got green, it's got chlorophyll in it, it can photosynthesize, but it's also going to steal a little bit, probably from the grass. It's probably stealing from the grass. And you can see we have many, uh, probably like three or four different species of grass here. Most of them are, are invasive, I believe. So you want to grow this, make sure you got some grass species that they can parasitize, and, uh, and just sprinkle seed everywhere. Sprinkle a bunch. You could try growing some in pots. It, but if you do that, of course, have a species of grass in the pot, too, that it can parasitize. So, a wonderful spill. It's just incredible. I mean, this thing, look at it. It almost looks like a damn rose, all right? In the Oro Bankesi, the paintbrush family. And this is one of the most beautiful species of paintbrush, all right, in the genus 
Castellet, and there's many. The West Texas has some really nice Castellet. Anyway, that's all I got. Have a great day. Go fuck yourself. Bye. Oh, oh. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention. <laughs> once, you, once you get those ovaries, all right, just put them in a little paper bag, let them dry out a week or two when they're all brown and crispy, crunch them open over the pot that you want to sow the seed in or outside in some bare soil next to some uh, some grasses and they'll come up. That's, there are many, many tiny seeds inside each one of these. One of those is a single fruit. And again, you can pick them right now as long as they're not too green. You can see these are already kind of starting to turn. But you want them, you want them right, right at this stage before they open. Put them in a paper bag, let them dry out, dehiss, and then they'll let out all those seeds. And you can grow, grow try growing some of these in your own yard or in a pot, whatever. Oh, God, I love this. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Oh, just get, get some seed. Put it in a bag. Let it dry out. You want it to dehiss. Look at that. Got quite a few. Look like little onions. Got, that's quite a few hundred seeds right there. I was I was wrong. It's not. It's probably not hummingbirds primarily pollinating that castellet. It's the pipe vine swallowtail. I mean, look at that guy's just going to town. You know, I just assume, it's not bees because bees don't see red, but uh, lepidopterans, butterflies do, and uh, so do hummingbirds. So there you go. You need the pipe vines for the host plant for the pipe vine swallowtails, and you need the pipe vine swallowtails to pollinate the castellet. You know, you catch a theme, everything's, everything's connected and what the shit. Look at those things. Look, there's so many of them. The pipe vine swallowtails. To get those, you got to have the pipe vine around. Aristolochia erecta or another Aristolochia species. I think it's mostly erecta that you get around here. Really cool flowers, too. Pollinated by uh, flies and fungus gnats. Look at, look at how many of them. Look at it. They're fucking pollinating everything. And they're going for this flax. Everything's connected. The flies that pollinate the Aristolochia enable these guys to then use the Aristolochia as their host plant, which then allows the flocks to get pollinated. And that flocks has evolved. Nothing else can pollinate. Bees can't pollinate that flocks. Look how tiny that hole in that flocks is. A bee couldn't climb in there. Only a butterfly proboscis could. And in doing so, it pulls out some pollen, puts it to the next flower, and puts it on the stigma and style of the next flower. Oh, God damn, it's nice out. Little prickly poppies, the argemony, invasive as hell on other continents, but native here and still, <laughs> still pretty aggressive. This is one of those plants, gorgeous, but you could look at it and tell, wow, if this got to another continent, across those barriers that have been isolating ecosystems and species for long periods of time, it would probably be very invasive over there. But here it's gorgeous and typical uh, poppy family flower morphology, many stamens. And of course, look, check out the stigma on there. Like five carpels, five lobes to that stigma. A little scrambled egg flower. Here's what the buds look like. Those are the sepals, spiky sepals. Yeah, a pile of some industrial refuse. And then we got the Sphoralcia lindheimeri. From the genus Sphoralcia. And of course, it's growing and he's hot on these sands. All right, hot, dry sites and sands, and it's just covered in the wool. Doesn't get very tall, tends to grow out, but it's still got that hibiscus-like flower morphology, many stamens on its central come. You can see little nectar pits at the base of those petals, and uh, there's a stigma in there as well. You can see it's kind of white. But just again, all those hairs, look at that. Selection pressure on these hot, dry sands. God damn, does Texas get hot. Really cool. Some members of this genus get upwards of five, six feet tall. You got your blue bonnets. And some physaria, these yellow bastards, and native mustard. Oh, I get it. Okay, we're at the north end of the Texas sand sheet. That's what's going on here, because I'm seeing a lot of sand sheet species like this yucca. Just saw a little uh, phacelia, one of the, the little ones. Oh, it looks like one of the, this is just a plantago, I think. But yeah, this is, so you're gonna get you're you're gonna get a lot of the, the sand sheet species. The Texas sand sheet you get a lot of endemics actually. Little Thamnophis proximus, Western ribbon snake. I think he's just a baby. Didn't shit on me. That's nice. Get some good photos. Where's your cloaca? Where's your hemipenis? All right, I'll let you go, man. Let's go. Ah, gentle, ever so gentle, you beautiful bastard. You tried to get away, but I want to love you. We're just gonna hang out. We're just gonna be friends for two or three minutes. Maybe you'll shit on me. 
then I'll let you go. I'll take a few photos, then I'll let you go. Shit, I mean, take a few photos, let you go. That sound, that didn't come out. I, I didn't mean it to sound like that. You know what I mean. And just like that, I seen my first copperhead. Oh, what a beautiful pit viper. God damn it. Oh, you are something else. Oh, that's nice. That's, that's nice. Oh, you looking sharp there, young stunner. Look at you. Huh? Yeah, don't, don't worry. I'm not getting any closer. I just, I just want to take some money shots. All right, though you're not a, you know, I've never heard any cases of you killing anybody, at least not recently. I still don't want a trip to the hospital. And this is America, you know, and nobody's got health insurance. So I'd have to be doing the fake name at the ER thing and then laughing as the medical bills roll in for upwards of three or four grand for an ER visit. Plus the anti I don't know how much it is. But you are, you are sharp. You are something else. Look at you. Yeah, raised up. That's right. What's going on? Oh, you're hot. Yeah, you're looking sharp. I'll take some money shots, then we'll put your little, I'll put this little uh, stack of tubes back on top of you there. Just a young one. Oh, this is one that I don't see every day. At least Nuttalanthus Texanus. Look at that nectar spur. A nectar spur normally implies a somewhat specialized pollination system. This is part of that corolla. It's got a little bit of nectar in there. I assume moth pollination. Lepidopteran pollinated too. Uh, butterfly, I mean, lepidop moths are lepidopters. You know what I mean.